Welcome back to Lab Rash Scientific. Now in this lab session, I want to touch on the concept of analyzing truss structures using the method of joints analytical approach. Now in this video, I'll talk about some theory, I'll perform some simple calculations, and I'm going to conduct a couple load experiments on my simple truss structure to verify the computational method. For more learning impact, I suggest you watch this video in conjunction with my video on building and testing a balsa wood truss structure as well as a labratscientific.com classroom lesson on the method of joints. Now, hopefully this information will provide budding engineers with some useful insights on the concept of engineering analysis. Let's start off by taking a look at the truss structure I'll be analyzing and testing as part of this video. Here's my experimental setup for my simple truss experiment. What I have is I have vertical two by four. It gives me a nice strong support for my truss. I've got a uh, diagonal truss member that's attached to the uh, 2 by 4 with a clamp. I have a horizontal truss member and that's attached to my force measuring device. Now the two ends of the uh, truss members are connected with a glue joint. Now I uh, need to make sure that things are horizontal so I have a uh, angle measuring device here to measure the horizontal truss member. And I can measure the inclination of the uh, diagonal truss member for my mathematical calculations later on. Now, when I hang weights on the end of the uh, truss, I can then determine using my force measuring device whether there is a tension or compression force in this horizontal truss member. I'll switch things around and try to make the same sort of measurements on this diagonal truss. And I should note that since this truss is supported only at one end, it's known as a cantilevered truss. And that, of course, means that one end is secure and one end is free. When I apply the uh, weight to the end of the truss, there'll be either compression or tension in this uh, truss member and a uh, compression or tension in this truss member. I'll take that data and then I'll compare it to the theoretical calculations and see how they compare. Now forces are vectors and thus they have direction and magnitude. So let's take a look at the sign conventions I'll be using as part of this lab. Here's a coordinate system we'll be using. The y-axis is the vertical axis, and the horizontal axis is x. Now, any y-force pointing upwards is known as a positive y-force, and any force pointing downwards will be defined as a negative y-force. Any force pointing to the right is a positive x-force, and any force pointing to the left is a negative x-force. Now, as far as compression and tension goes, if the beam force vector is pointing towards the pin joint, then the beam is in compression. And if the beam force vector is pointing away from the pin joint, then the beam is in tension. I'll also be using some trigonometry, so here's a quick review. I'm not going to go into details, so I have to uh, study that on your own. Now the members in a truss structure can have three loading states. Number one, there can be no load, a zero load, or the member can be in compression or in tension. What do we mean by tension and compression? Well, tension attempts to stretch the beam, or in this case, this balsa wood stick. So here I have my uh, balsa wood stick, my member, attached to a weight. And so that weight is pulling down along the axis of my stick. And so this balsa wood beam is in tension. Now, compression attempts to squish the beam. So here's the same balsa wood stick. Now if I apply a force at the top, you'll see the compression will ultimately want to bend the stick. So that's the compressive force. And this bending is known as buckling. And actually if I apply too much force, the yeah, beam will break and fail under compression. However, in tension, a beam can support quite a bit more weight if it's in tension as opposed to compression. Before we get into the analytical details, let's take a look at some of the geometry that goes into building a good structure. If you examine various bridges and truss structures, you'll notice they use a lot of triangular shapes. Have you ever wondered why? Well, a triangle is a very stable geometric shape. Now here's my triangular structure. What I have is each of the members are pinned together at the corners. Now, if I apply a force to the left or right, the uh, structure remains very stiff. It doesn't change shape at all. Now, in contrast, 
If I were to use a rectangular structure, again, my beams are attached by pins at the, at the uh, corners. If I apply that lateral force to the left or right, the uh, structure itself deforms. So it deforms relatively easy. And that's not a good geometric shape to be using in structures. Now we're ready to dive into a short method of joints analysis of my cantilevered triangular truss. Here's a simple truss structure we'll be analyzing. It's got two beams, it forms a triangle, and it's supported by a vertical mast. So it's a cantilevered triangular beam. Now, the diagonal beam is 18 inches in length. The horizontal beam is 15 inches in length. And there's 10 inches between points B and C on the vertical mast. And the angle made by the two beams is 34 degrees. We're going to put a load of one pound at point A, pulling down on the triangular truss system. Now this lesson is dealing with statics. This means that all the truss members and joints are not moving. And that means that all forces must be balanced in the X and Y directions. So let's take a look at the free body diagram of the truss structure. I've got my one pound force acting at point A downward. I'll have reactive forces at point B in the X direction and the Y direction, and reactive forces acting at point C in the horizontal direction and vertical direction. The first thing I'm going to do is analyze this as a system free body diagram, just looking at the external forces applied to the truss and the reactive forces that are generated. Now what I can do with my one pound downward force acting at point A is I can move it upward and it's still equivalent to the original diagram. Now this force is acting along the horizontal beam at 15 inches. What that force does is it creates a counterclockwise moment around point B. I can calculate that moment as the moment is equal to force times distance. So M sub B is one pound times 15 inches or a 15 inch pound moment about point B. Now point C has to offer some resistive force in order to counteract that counterclockwise moment. Again, this is a static system. Again, here's my 15 inch pound uh, moment. I want to counteract that with a clockwise moment so the system is static. And here's my R3, my resistive force, which is going to uh, create that moment. And that force is going to act 10 inches from point B. Again, here's my moment equation. I insert the knowns into the equation and I then solve for R3. That's 15 inch pounds divided by 10 inches. Or R3, the force acting horizontally at point C is 1.5 pounds. Now if I look at the one pound weight hanging from point A, I can calculate other forces within my system. I simply move that force vector up above point A, it's equivalent to the original diagram, it allows me to create a right triangle here that allows me to calculate various forces in the system. I can move my angle up. It allows me to calculate this blue vector, which is the force along member AB. I utilize sine theta to go opposite over hypotenuse. I get the hypotenuse is equal to opposite divided by sine theta. Plug in some numbers. I can ultimately determine that the force along member AB is 1.8 pounds. So you see from the system diagram, I can calculate the tension or compression in the two members, but I don't know for sure if they're in compression or tension. Now let's analyze our simple triangle truss using the method of joints. The method of joints analyzes each connecting joint in the structure individually. So we'll take a look at point A, point B and point C during this analysis. Now, since point A has a known downward force, 1.0 pounds, it makes a good starting point for the analysis. Now, we also know there's a diagonal member, AB, which must apply a force to point A to keep it in static equilibrium. We label this force FAB and select its sense. Now, the sense is the direction that the force is acting. We should realize this force needs to be pulling upwards to balance the downward force. We also know there's a horizontal member, AC, that is applying a force to point A. We label this force FAC, 
but the sense is a little more difficult to determine. As such, we make our best guess. So I'm going to make the sense towards the left for force AC. And that diagram results in the free body diagram for point A. Since we have a known vertical force of 1.0 pounds, we should start off by analyzing the vertical forces or the Y direction forces. We'll ignore the horizontal forces for now. There are two vertical forces acting on point A, the downward force, which we know as 1.0 pounds, and the upward force depicted by the green arrow. Now we need to sum the forces in the Y direction. Since the system is assumed to be in static equilibrium, the sum of these forces must be equal to zero. So we have the sum of the forces in the y direction equal to zero. We can write that equation as plus f upwards plus the f downwards, which is a minus f, is equal to zero. Again, the negative sign indicates a downward force. Now the problem is we don't know the magnitude of the upward force. However, using trigonometry, we can express this upward force in terms of the force in member AB. That force is FAB, as defined earlier. So here's an equation for the upward force. It's sine 34 degrees times this unknown FAB. Now inserting the forces into the force equation yields the sum of the forces in the Y is equal to the upward force plus the downward force, as shown here, is equal to zero. Inserting the uh, forces in, we get the sum of the F direction forces is equal to the sine 34 times FAB plus the minus one pound, which of course is a downward force, and that's all equal to zero. You can apply a little algebra to determine the magnitude of force AB. Here's our equation once again, sine 34 times FAB plus minus one pound is equal to zero. Apply some algebra, I get uh, 0 0.56 FAB is equal to plus one pound. And as a result, I get FAB is equal to one pound divided by 0.56 or FAB is 1.8 pounds. Now, force AB is ultimately what we want since it tells us the magnitude of the force in member AB. Since the math used to generate FAB results in a positive value, the sense we selected was correct. So the black arrow pointing up to the right-hand top of the screen is the correct sense for that force FAB. And the next step is to analyze the horizontal or x-direction forces at point A. In our original diagram, we had already defined force FAC as being generated by the horizontal member AC. You see that here in the black horizontal uh, direction arrow. We define it as a left-pointing force, so it is a negative force. We also have the diagonal member AB pulling on point A. This force is the horizontal component of FAB. We already determined that FAB was pointing towards the upper right of the screen, so the component will also point towards the right. As such, it is a positive force. So the light blue arrow is a rightward force, which is a positive force. Now, as done in the Y direction, the X direction forces are summed and set equal to zero. So here we have the sum of the forces in the X direction equal to zero. You can insert the forces into that force equation and it yields the sum of the forces in the X direction is equal to cosine 34 degrees times FAB plus minus FAC is equal to zero. So performing some simple algebra yields cosine 34 times FAB is equal to plus FAC. And we get 0.83 times the 1.8 pounds, which is the force in AB direction is equal to FAC, and ultimately we get a, an answer of FAC, the horizontal force acting in the direction of the black arrow, of 1.5 pounds. Now, FAC is the force generated by the horizontal member AC. And since the sign of FAC was calculated as a positive value, or plus 1.5 pounds, the leftward sense that was originally selected for force AC was correct. Now, force FAC balances the rightward force component being generated by the diagonal member AB and thus keeps the system in static equilibrium in the X direction. Now, if we look at the X and Y forces acting on point A, we see that they all balance each other, indicating the system is in static equilibrium. 
By analyzing point A, we were able to determine the magnitude and the correct sense of the forces in the two truss members. You see that depicted here at the right. You have FAB acting upwards towards the right of 1.8 pounds, and FAC, the red arrow, pointing to the left, and that's 1.5 pounds. Now, from the vector convention defined earlier, we can identify if the beams are in tension or compression, and we can use this information to design the members in the truss. And looking at the diagram at the right, you see the purple arrows are pointing away from the points towards the center of the beam. So that means the uh, beam is in tension and it's at 1.8 pounds. And you see on the horizontal member, the arrow is pointing towards the endpoints, which means it's in compression. And so member AC is in 1.5 pounds of compression. Now we know the forces in the members, but we also need to know the reactive forces being generated by point B and point C so we can adequately design the whole truss system. So taking a look at point B, we recall that member AB is exerting a diagonal force at point B. And this diagonal force can be broken down into horizontal and vertical components. So here's a horizontal component, which is cosine 34 degrees times 1.8 pounds, which equals 1.5 pounds. And note that that's in the negative direction. And the vertical component is calculated using sine 34 degrees times 1.8 pounds. And that's equal to 1.0 pounds. And that's acting downward, which is a negative force. Now to find the reactive forces being generated by point B, we simply sum forces in the X and Y directions and set them equal to zero, as was done for point A. So here's our horizontal forces being summed. So I have the uh, right word force FBX plus minus 1.5 pounds is equal to zero. Doing the algebra, I get FBX is equal to plus 1.5 pounds. Do the same for the forces in the Y direction. And I get FBY is equal to plus 1.0 pounds. Now, because those are positive uh, numbers, the uh, senses of those forces in the vertical and horizontal directions are correct. Now, these forces are being applied by point B to resist the forces being applied by member AB. So again, since everything's equal and opposite, the point is in static equilibrium. Now we can take a look at point C. Now, there's only one force acting on point C, and that was a horizontal force being applied by member AC. And that was 1.5 pounds pushing towards the right. So we have a opposing force of FCX pushing towards the left. Again, summing forces uh, in the x direction and setting it equal to zero yields a horizontal force FCX is equal to plus 1.5 pounds. Again, since that answer is a positive number from the math, the uh, sense we have there in the green arrow, the leftward pointing green arrow, is the correct direction for that resistive force being applied by point C. Now, this is the force being applied at point C to resist the force being pushed on by member AC. So again, since those are equal and opposite, the point is in static equilibrium. Now here are all the forces acting on the system. You see the tension and compression in the members, and you see the reactive forces that oppose those tensions and compressions. I want to stress the uh, sign convention for the force arrows. Now, when you run through the mathematics, you'll generate a force either at the point or in the member, and it'll either be positive or negative. In this case, force FAC is equal to positive 1.5 pounds. Now that means my sense direction on my black horizontal arrow was correct. I assumed it was pointing to the left. The mathematics generate a positive number, and that means my sense direction was correct. Now, if I went to the math and this answer FAC equal minus 1.5 pounds, that means my original sense for my force direction was wrong. And I have to flip this arrow around and make it point to the right to get the proper sense in my diagram. So remember, if the mathematics gives you a negative number, that means the sense for your force was incorrect and you need to flip it. If the uh, mathematics gives a positive value, that means the original sense that you assumed was correct. The method of joints allowed us to calculate the forces acting at the pin joints as well as the forces acting in the truss members. Now, how do we know that this method generates reliable results? 
Well, the simple truss structure that was selected for this analysis makes it fairly easy to conduct experiments to determine the actual compressive and tension forces in the truss members themselves. So let's go ahead and take a look at an experiment to see if we can validate whether the method of joints produces good results. Now here's a test for the horizontal member. See, initially there's zero pounds of force on that horizontal beam. Now I apply the one pound weight at the end of the truss. You'll see a load of minus 1.54. So again, the sign convention for this load measuring device, that's a compressive force pushing towards the right. Now here's a setup for the diagonal member. Again, you see a zero pound tension or compression in that beam initially. Now I'll hang the one pound weight off the truss again. And you'll see about a 1.82 or so pound force. Now it's a positive value. So that means that beam is in tension. So those results match the analysis quite well. That tells me the method of joints does a pretty good job at predicting the uh, tension and compression in truss members. Now the truss structure in this example was extremely simple. So the computations weren't very complicated. In fact, some of the forces you could surmise without actually doing any computations. However, if you design more complicated trusses with internal members and more joints, the computations will be more complex. They'll have more angles and more forces. Well, there you have it. Now you've seen how you can use the method of joints to analyze a truss structure. Now there's something very important you need to remember. You can't just analyze the nominal case. A good engineer will analyze off nominal cases where the loads might be in different locations, where the beams might be bending or being offset in some way. This allows you to make a worst case analysis to make sure your truss structure or your bridge is as strong as it needs to be. Well, keep on learning and I hope to see you next time at LabRat Scientific.